FL Studio's Mixer has some pretty cool options. Some of them most people know about, some of them most people don't. In this video, you will learn all this information to make your Mixer game strong. Please smash that like button and subscribe. So first thing we'll go over is our drop down settings here. We've got disk recording, render to wave files, anything that is armed like this is. So I could arm this for example, anything running through that track for the duration of your song on your playlist will be rendered into a wave file with the effects attributed to them from this insert. And you can quickly do this with Alt R. If I click Alt R, you'll see we get some exporting options. Next thing in the list is auto unarm. When this is checked, every time that you are done recording, it will unarm the armed tracks automatically, making you have to rearm them before you re-record or re-export. Next, we have auto create audio clip. Recordings will be saved, of course, after you record. However, you need to have this on in order for it to auto create an audio clip and for you to have that popping up in your playlist. And to note with that when recording, if I'm recording into here, generally when you record, it's going to pop up to the next available section, which would be track four down here. If I link this to my vocal, however, and I record this way, it'll create a group underneath, which will allow me to organize my vocals into this section of the song. Now that I've armed it, an example, as you can see, we drop this down and we can keep our organization that way. Rather than the normal way, check, check, it gives me the next available position. Next, we have latency compensation. You're always going to want this on. This compensates for the latency of the project when you are recording. Otherwise, your recordings are going to come in off time. 32-bit float recording. This is going to give you the highest quality recording you can get when it comes to 16-bit versus 32-bit. 32-bit just means more data points along your amplitude of the waves to keep information. I don't quite know all the technicalities, but that's the basic idea. If your incoming audio is less than 32 bit, this will not actually give you the increase in quality because that audio is already going to be mapped to a lower bit rate. Next, we have auto name playlist tracks. From my understanding, this is for if I was to, well, how these are named vocal from my vocal recording. When we recorded this earlier, since my mixer was vocal, it auto named the playlist track vocal. We also have group loop recorded takes. So if I was to loop record, check, 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 check. It's going to drop me down into these little groups here. However, if I was to turn that off and loop record again, check, 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 check. As you'll see, we don't get it in this little grouped section. It comes in not grouped. We have plugin delay compensation, which you'll often see abbreviated as PDC. Reset manual latency on all tracks. So any plugins or anything where you've been setting the latency manually, which you generally won't need to do, but if you do, this will reset it. And you would do that, for example, by going down here. I set a manual latency. I reset the manual latency. We also have automatic, which means it does automatic plugin delay compensation. This is something that you want. I can't think of many scenarios where you don't want your latency compensated for because that'll throw your whole track out of time. You also have compensate automations, which makes sure that automations are basically matched up with the delay of a plugin. That way, the effects changes that happen within the plugin actually happen at the correct time when the plugin gets compensated. So if my automation's here and my plugin's here, and my track marker is back here too. FL Studio is going to compensate and move the automation to synchronize with the plugin and move the plugin to synchronize with the playhead that's back here. So you'll want this on. Link all parameters. If I click this, is going to let us link to every single one of these mixer tracks. 
and each option that is on these mixer tracks. So if you go buy yourself a giant mixer board, that is perfect for this. You can sync all of those up, save that as a template in FL Studio, and be good to go. Akai actually sells smaller mixer boards that you can go look up that are perfect for routing a few of these. And what you can actually do after that is you can right-click right each thing you want to route to. You can click Override Global Link, link it to what you want on your MIDI controller, and that link will actually last forever, no matter what template you open up. We also have a view section where we can change what we're seeing within FL Studio. Each of these is going to account for something in here. Some of these options will or will not be seen depending on the layout you choose here. We also have this detached option. Detaching allows us to drag this over to a, another window. Uh, if we have two monitors, it actually kind of detaches and takes you outside of FL Studio's grasp. Um, you may recognize this if you're familiar with detaching plugins. We won't go through the rest of these right now. We will go over them in a little bit and you will see why. Next, we have multi-touch control. If you turn this on, it'll turn on the multi-touch options for if you're touching a trackpad more than once. For example, recognizing two fingers uh, versus one. I'll leave a link below showing what those controls are. We have view waveforms, which we already saw before. And we have extra volume and stereo properties, which is going to be down here, which will give us stereo separation, polarity reversing if we're having phasing issues, left and right channel swaps. And again, these will or will not be viewable depending upon which one of these options you have selected for the entire view of the mixer. We also have our little track inspector on the right hand side and the ability to open and close anything that might be docked to our left or right hand sides. There's nothing docked to the right, but we will show more about that in a little bit. So really briefly, let's talk about signal flow in the mixer. This is important. You're not going to want to miss this. Anything coming into a mixer track will be up here. This is where the signal flow starts. So even for something like this track here, track four, the actual start for insert four is going to be here. From here, we have input latency adjustments where we can adjust the latency of the input coming in before it hits the mixer. And then once it's in that mixer track, we have all these different sections where we can load and place effects. It goes from here to the EQ, after the EQ, this section here that's blank can be thought of as your mute, panning, volume, stereo separation, and all of these controls. Those basically live right here in this empty space. After that, we've got our track latency, which accounts for any latency in plugins. And then, and only after that, the track will get sent out to the master or somewhere else if you choose an audio output target. If I click here, you'll see this track is routed to our submix. Our submix is routed to our phone output as well as our master output. If you're curious about this phone output, I'll tell you something cool in a second. Now we can hook these wherever we want or unhook them as well as click and turn them down. Now the reason understanding this signal flow is something that you're going to want to do is if I, for example, have an auxiliary track over here and I want to hear what's going on in my parallel compression, for example, or whatever parallel track, by just routing it this normal way, it's getting sent over after here, which is after our mute of the original track. So we will never be able to hear this by itself unless we understand the signal flow and then we can work around that and we can actually hear this by itself. To show this example, I have actually loaded up a melody into insert five. So if I wanna hear insert seven here by itself, I could always hook or unhook this, but depending on the routing, I may not wanna deal with that. I might wanna just mute. In which case you'll notice that we are not hearing it in track seven. If I add a fruity send though, and I send this to our insert seven, 
then even when this is muted, we're going to hear it. And the reason is because these effects are prior to this section here, which is where our mute and our volume and all of that is. So we're actually sending information prior to the CQ and prior to anything in here. And this is exceptionally useful if we want to do our send before certain effects. Another thing to be noted about routing like this is my volume here is down because I'm getting my send through my fruity send and not through the actual volume meter here. When this is turned down, it is considered side-chained. It is considered side-chained because insert 7 is still getting information, although it's not getting actual amplitude. This is exceptionally useful in the case of things like Waves F6, where I can come to the back and go to processing and turn my stereo auxiliary to insert five. And now I can do sidechain compression based off of that channel coming into here. So if I needed to make room for something like a vocal, I can route it in the sidechain manner. And I could sidechain with any plugin that has a sidechain option by going to the back processing, and you'll generally see an input for your sidechain. Native FL Studio plugins, like the Fruity Limiter, actually automatically route it, so I can do it here. You do not have to do it in the back of the plugin. Anything that you might see that's grayed out, you can't route to, generally because it's being routed to the track in question already. So if I routed insert five to submix or routed submix to insert five, we'd get feedback and an overload. And FL Studio says they're not even gonna give us the option for that. Now that we've covered our routing, our sidechain, as well as covering the fact we can't route backwards to things, creating feedback loops, let's talk about the stuff that's routed to nothing. My vocal is routed to nothing right now. Reason being is I'm giving it a direct out here at the bottom using my ACO driver, which is feeding directly into my screen recording software to record my vocal as a separate track from the rest of my DAW. Using the same option, I have an output going on here that is actually routed to a routing software that actually includes a little streaming service in it, which you can stream directly to your cell phone. So I can reference on my cell phone directly without having to export and send it to my cell phone. So if you wanna learn about that, I have a video on that above. Now with a quick understanding of how this is routed, we can actually choose where to record when our track is armed via this little red arming button. And we can arm external input only, which means only my vocal right now would get recorded before any effects. We can do external and mixer input. This means that insert four is routed to our submix. If I was to arm and record my submix, I could record it at any mixer input. So that would record insert four prior to any effects. We have post effects, which is of course after the effects before the EQ, post EQ, which is after the EQ and before any of our track options. We have post level and panning, which means after the level and panning. And then we have post track, which is just completely after all of this at the export. We also can monitor things either when armed or on or not monitor them at all. I also have a section where I can choose my input for my microphone or anything else that I have as an input coming into my interface or FL Studio. In order to be able to choose this microphone, if you can't do it, your audio settings, you need to have an ACO driver chosen as your device. If you want to learn these audio settings in depth, I have a whole video for that. Now, in the event that I am sent out through here without being routed to an actual mixer track anywhere else, there's an option for compensate for master latency. And this is so that any tracks that bypass the master will still be synced to the master track, which in most cases you will actually want to have happen. Now, some things that people wonder when they're routing is if I'm clipping in insert five, but I turn it down in insert seven, am I safe? The answer is maybe. In the digital world, clipping isn't actually going to happen until you render it out clipping in the master or it hits a plugin that doesn't allow anything over zero decibels. Some plugins will not allow that. While in the analog world, 
clipping is clipping. There's nothing else to do about it. As soon as it starts running hot, you start getting that saturation. Eventually, it's going to distort. Now, this should never really be a problem, however, because when you're working your projects, honestly, you should be gain staging. Negative 18 decibels full scale is a good area to aim for when gain staging. With your peaks not going over like 8 or 6 dB, honestly, the semantics of it doesn't really matter as long as you're giving enough headroom for somebody to have headroom to work in your project, as well as you're keeping the dynamic range, which is the fluctuation between louder and quieter. As long as that range isn't way too big or completely squashed. A good reason, though, for keeping it at negative 18 is a lot of these emulations and plugins you're going to get are going to be based off of old analog hardware. And old analog hardware used to use VU meters, and I believe those VU meters were programmed for around negative 18 decibels full scale. I'm starting to get into some things that I learned about that I don't quite remember the exact facts, so correct me if I'm wrong. However, the idea is something around that. And so a lot of these programs are going to be optimized or made to work in that range. In the analog world, they did this because if you ran it too hot, you got too much saturation. If you ran it too low, there was noise on what they called the noise floor. And running it too low after compressing things like that, you could bring that noise floor out and that could mess with your project. So they standardized or kind of made a standard at where they worked at. And if these plugins are based off that, you should probably keep yourself in that area. Now, FL Studio native plugins, I've noticed aren't really based off of this gain staging. For example, the soft clipper, if you're hitting about negative 18 dB, uh, won't be able to be pushed very hard without adding some pregame. So this is just things to note. And now with that being said, this is why you understanding the signal flow is so important. Because if you turn your mixer down and your effects in here, you want to aim for negative dB. If you turn your mixer down to try and get negative 18, it doesn't matter. This volume knob is after all these effects. If you're clipping and going above zero decibel, and this effect doesn't allow you to go past zero decibel, changing this does nothing. So you want to be thinking about the gain while you're in your channel rack using these knobs prior to coming in to your mixer track. If going and changing that is not going to help you, FL Studio has a tool called Fruity Balance, and Fruity Balance will allow you to change the volume pre whatever effect that you're going to be using. If you don't care about any of that, but you also want to turn down your entire mix, you can do so by clicking Control, dragging, and then turning down the volume or faders of your entire track. You can change specific ones by clicking Control, letting go, holding Shift, and clicking again. If you don't click Shift and you just click Control, it'll restart it. A quick way to rename a mixer track is just by holding shift and clicking. This will allow you to change the colors as well as the name. You can also, if you're on that mixer track, click F2. When renaming and choosing colors, we've got our different palette options here, as well as some hotkeys for colors. So the latest color you use will be moved to zero. So if I choose this green and click enter and say this one is green and my next one is going to be in the same thing for example multiple instruments green two i can click here zero enter enter speeds up your workflow super great now the reason that we didn't go over all of these is because these are actually mixer track specific which you'll see if you right click a specific mixer track you'll notice on the top we have the rename which we just did by clicking f2 or shift we have change color, which will change just the color. Uh, we also have change icon, which is also an option when renaming by clicking this drop down here. We also have quick preset options here to choose from, which are also pre-colored along with a symbol. If I right click, we have a quick option to assign to new audio tracks. See this A here? It'll now be linked in the playlist to the next empty available track. Because all of these ones up here were named, it assumed those were taken and put us at the bottom. Assigning in this matter lets us arm and unarm the track for recording. 
as well as choose our input via our microphone and other options. It also lets us choose where we start recording. If I want to unassign, I can click the unassign option. We've got file where we can open presets, which will fill our mixer track with preset options. Um, much like this is all set up over here, I have it as a preset, YouTube, vocal, Sean Devine reference. You can save a mixer track by clicking save, and that'll actually add it down here. And we can also take anything that's in this mixer, just load something up, SSL channel, for example. And we can take the entire state of this mixer, panning, volume, everything. And anytime you see this little pointy option here, it's because we can actually click and drag. And now we have a complete duplicate of this mixer dragged over here. Now, looking at this, in this new section over here, if I wanted, I could add an Edison audio editor track or an audio logger, which is another audio Edison track but instead it's got the record option selected. That way we can immediately get to recording or logging audio. We can also, if we don't want this duplicated track, reset the selected track to default. And with that said, I will control select these tracks and I can do it in a batch action. Next in our dropdown, we have channel routing. I can route selected channels to this track. That means if I go here, I can select multiple channels. Right click, channel routing, route selected channels to this track. Now, if I open this back up, you'll see all the ones that were highlighted are now ran to track eight. You can see the shortcut is control L. So with those still selected, if I go here, I can click control L and it'll do it again. With those still selected, we'll notice that we have an option for route selected channels starting from this track. This will route the ones at the top of the channel rack here to insert 10 and anything underneath it to the right track by track. And I can do this with the shift control L hotkey that we see here, giving me the same exact result if I was to click it itself. So I will highlight these, right click, reset selected tracks to default. The routing will still say, stay the same, although I reset the names. So as you can see here, this routing is all still the same. So to simplify it, I'll just route them all to this track. Next thing we have is track routing, which as you can see is grayed out. If we select multiple tracks, however, though, and we right click, we have some options. We can route all the selected ones here to this track specifically. Uh, we can route the selected ones to this track only, which won't just add routing, but it will take away any other routing. So to show this, if I had an auxiliary track here for, I don't know, parallel compression, and I wanted to parallel compress all of these, I can highlight them, right click the track for my parallel, track routing, route selected to this track. And now you'll see they're all routed to this track as well as the submix they were routed to before. You can also do this by highlighting a bunch right clicking the one you want to route to and clicking route to this track or route to this track only, which again will unroute them from the submix and route them to that singular track. Our other options consist of side chain selected to this track or side chain selected to this track only, which is going to be for side chain information with it turned down. If I side chain to this track only, I want you to notice that this will delete any actual routing. So all of the live turned on volume you were getting to these other tracks will now disappear. And these are again available if we right click down at the bottom. Our next options are some interesting ones. We have route this track to selected, which means the track I right clicked will get routed to all the selected ones. Route this track to selected only, which is the same thing with the only option as well as side chains doing the same. But then here on the bottom left, we have create submix. Create submix will do something cool. I will name it. If these were all my instruments, this would be my instrument submix. Now they will all be routed to it, but not only that, they will have names. These are all gonna be named instrument submix, but this one will be named instrument submix master. So if I had a violin section, for example, I could select all these, right click, track routing, violin, and what just happened there? 
Well, what just happened there was because instead of clicking to the center of the group, I clicked to the outside of the group. We got these little separators on either side. Get rid of the separators. In order to make this more clear, I will right click and I will reset selected tracks routing. Now that I reset all that routing, I will reset the names and we will try this again. If I select these, right click in the middle, create submix, and I name this middle, you'll see middle master, all those are middle. If I come over here, select these ones, and I right click the one to the outside, and I go track routing, create submix, side, you'll see this one is grouped and we have it named side. Next option we have is select. So if I right click, select channels routed to this track, It'll now select all the channels in here routed to the track. I can select tracks this one is routed to, which will select our master because that's where it's going. I can also do tracks routed to this one. So if I go submix, select tracks routed to this one, it'll select all of the ones routed to our submix. And we can also select group, which we can do a group by highlighting these, right clicking, create group, group name. Group. So these are all now kind of considered grouped together. Select group, and now I can group all of them, or now I can select all of them. We can get rid of the separators. Now doing so, I want you to notice we have this disappear for auto color group. And that is because having separators on either side actually considers this a group or not a group. We now have an auto color group option. If I change my color to anything here, I can either right click auto color group to the original color or auto color group to the color of the one that I just chose. Anything you right click, that'll be the color for the rest of the group. Now that we've gone over that, you've seen me reset routing with this option here. We also have solo selected tracks. And so I can either right click a track or I can highlight tracks, come in here and click solo selected tracks or S and then I can also click Alt S, which will undo that, or right click Alt Solo Selected Tracks. Now what's cool about Alt S, something else that Alt S does, is when you're actually soloing something, you can choose it, and it'll solo every track that is going to it. And so that's great for if I have a submix for my whole track, I can click Alt and do the solo, and it'll have my whole track ready to go, I can have a reference in this other section and I can solo that one and then switch quickly back and forth. Another thing we have for our options with our muting here is if you hold shift, you can actually lock your mute for something. So now how my vocal was going in and out of the projects before, I can actually mute everything and this channel will stay the same. I can, however, come and change it by clicking it itself, but Anything else I change will leave it unaffected. So if you want to lock some tracks muted, you can do so. Now with these mute buttons, if you want to be able to flip between how they were and how they are, you can go options, general settings, restore previous state after solo. And what will happen is every time I mute and unmute, these will go back to how they were. You can clear this, however, by clicking control when you mute and unmute. Under this, we also have our arm and disarm selected tracks, which will arm and disarm. These selected tracks, you've seen the things in our group section and something I love is doc two. I will generally put my submixes, references and everything docked to the left here. Auxiliary tracks and things like that, I will dock to the right over here to give me a nice workflow and a cool interface. If you want to see some of the cool templates I've done, click above and they utilize all these presets and all these options. And I talk about them as I go through them, how they work and how the workflow is. Something to note is you keep your insert number, even though you've docked right or docked left, which can affect some things like the fruity send, for example because the fruity send works by numbers. So if I go to insert six, it's gonna be number two, which means the second thing in my routing. If I go to insert seven, 
and set it to that, it means it's going to be the third thing in my routing. And so if I was to route this to insert four, for example, insert seven is now the fourth thing in my routing, which means I am now no longer routed to my auxiliary channel. And so therefore, if I make my auxiliary channel one of the first and very first options available by making it insert one, I can tell Fruity Send it is number one and it'll never lose its priority because I can't put anything before it. <laughs> the very last thing we have is allow threaded processing. And this will decide whether this mixer track allows threaded processing or not. And what threaded processing is, is threaded processing. It takes the core of your processor or a core of your processor and splits it up into little virtual cores. These virtual cores help processing speed. They can, however, cause issues with some plugins. And so you can change that in the plugin specifically by going into the wrapper and turning off allow threaded processing, which if your autosave is on here, should autosave and you'll never have to worry about again. If you want to do a quick troubleshoot of all your plugins in a project, you can go audio settings and turn off your multi-threaded uh, processing for any mixers or the generators here. Again, I've got a whole video going over the audio settings section if you want to check it out. But that is pretty much that. So congratulations. You are now a pro in the FL Studio Mixer. We went over literally everything. There is a lot to summarize in the summary. So just check out the timestamps below and jump around to anything you want to know. And I hope this video was helpful. If you like this video, please like this video. If you have any comments, please comment. I always appreciate a subscribe. It's Warren with Scale Audio and adios.